many times, it would be difficult to decipher, for example, mm -hmm. some writings. Uh, we found stones with the same unknown writings in Ecuador, Colombia, United States, France, Malta, Australia. Always it's the same writing. So that means there must have been a global contact or even a global civilization in past time. Yeah, one would think. Uh, you know, it kind of goes back to Atlantis and Lemuria and probably way before that. Uh, that's what I also think. Uh, one stone we found in Ecuador, it's a very big stone. It has about uh, 700 pounds, and it's uh, quartz granite. granite. Mm -hmm. And uh, there you have the uh, a kind of world map on it with uh, two continents which do not exist in our days, mm -hmm. one in the Atlantic and one in the Pacific Ocean. That would make sense, considering the, the real history of Earth, you know. And, and you know, I was reading up on uh, uh, Earth changes and things of that nature, and, and they said if we did go through a pole shift, and if the uh, poles, which are 42 kilometers at the at the equator, were to move, uh, you'd have whole continents rising and falling, and and because of the bulge would change, and and that would be pushing the oceans in a big washing machine effect, you know, back and forth and, and uh, really across the land. And it, it, it would. It would pretty much erase most of our civilization. And, and we would end up be going back to uh, bows and arrows. Basically, once, the, once whatever guns and ammo we had left ran out, you know, we, we would probably have to go back to, you know, fashioning our own equipment over out of what we had to survive. Uh, what I think uh, in in my researches is, is uh, why uh, the so-called oldest knowledge or oldest civilizations are always in uh, very high uh, areas like uh, Tibet, like uh, Bolivia, Tiwanaku, like uh, the Valley of of uh, Mexico. All those places where there are real old civilizations, except Egypt. Egypt is very low, but who knows? if it once was, uh, wasn't was higher or deeper in any case. But uh, that's, that's another very interesting question. Why this old knowledge and very old things are always or mainly in high areas? And probably the other areas were scoured by the waves or, or uh, you know, everything is pretty much, you probably find things on the ocean floor, but we're not doing that much exploration down there. We're, we're busy zipping around in space right now. <laughs> But I think uh, they are still not not only on the deep sea. Uh, I think also in many many uh, continents in jungle area, there is still so much under the jungle or under the earth, which could uh, could give us a lot of information about Earth's uh, past. Yeah, I know I had Michael Tellinger on the show a while ago, and he was, you know, supposedly found Adam's calendar, and or or he was involved with the people that found it, and. Uh, uh, amazing the information they were, they were giving there, which ties back to a lot of the old legends, uh, you know, of Inki and Enlil and the Anunnaki and, you know, the Sumerian information. So uh, I think if we start taking those old legends seriously and start digging around where we think they might be, that uh, we'll be uncovering all kinds of, of, uh, of new artifacts. Definitely. I am uh, in contact in several months with uh, Michael and we exchange uh, information. Mm -hmm. And I had a trip uh, this May to Sardinia, where there are big, big uh, stone uh, towers, so-called nuragis, up to 24 meters with huge stone blocks, perfectly done. Mm -hmm. For the archaeologists, uh, those uh, towers are defense towers. But can you imagine a defense tower with no window, only with one entrance? I think uh, there wouldn't be a good chance for self-defense if you are inside, because if they put fire in, on, on, uh, at the entrance, after a while you, you must come out. So they, they found out, researchers in Sardinia, that this, uh, were these towers, and there were over, uh, over 8,000 in Sardinia Island, Mm -hmm. that they were archaeoastronomical towers, and they have 
certain similarity to the stone circles uh, of South Africa. So we are trying now to find out uh, what kind of uh, similarity those uh, buildings or those men who built them uh, had. Mm-hmm. And uh, there, there are other such uh, stone circles like in South Africa, also in Russia, in Arkaim. They found also many, many of those stone circles. And the question is, for what reason did they build them? And uh, Michael told me that uh, they uh, make a sound of uh, 14.5 gigahertz with 72 decibel. That means uh, a very interesting uh, sound. Uh, We have to find out more about the possibilities, uh, what to do with those. Mm Mm-hmm. I know some people that work with sound, and they have all the frequencies down. They have the frequency of love and everything. It's amazing. And and unfortunately, a lot of the sound uh, work has gone into some other black projects, so we haven't gotten, you know, into that. But, uh, you know, I know they can do a lot with sound and, and uh, you know, different frequencies and just send them and actually, you know, excite people, agitate people, sedate people. They can do anything they want with these frequencies, but... You know, my feeling, too, is that they can actually generate energy with, with these frequencies. And, and uh, you know, maybe a lot of these things are, are ways of focusing the Earth's energy itself uh, in a way that, that they could utilize. Yes. Yes. And most probably there are also legions that uh, stones, very heavy stones, were transported with uh, sound. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have uh, some information that came through another source, more of a spiritual source about the pyramids and some of these artifacts. And and when I was looking into it, uh, a lot of them, you can see there was extreme heat applied uh, to these stones at one time because you can see the crystalline, you know, structure melted. And they figured out it was at least five to 7,000 degrees was used on on some of these stones. So I've always felt uh, just, in my own memories going back, because I had a, a near-death experience that opened everything up and I started seeing all these past lives. But I actually saw how some of these things were built, and, and it wasn't, you know, a bunch of slaves, you know, dragging these things over over uh, palm trunks or whatever at all, that they, they used actually a laser technology to cut these stones and then a sound technology to actually levitate them into place, which which would only make sense that these, like pyramids and things of that nature, were actually built with some extreme technology. Uh, it, the, just the logistics of it is that's the only way they could have been made. The logistic itself, if you think to build the Great uh, Pyramid with uh, thousands of stones inside, mm-hmm. uh, hundreds of ton stone uh, uh, walls and everything, to do that so perfect, what kind of knowledge they must have had yeah, just to build. It wouldn't be even easy in nowadays to do such such a monument. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the, you think about the base of the pyramid and how that was laid out uh, so accurately, and over time it hasn't moved. Basically, uh, it, it's just unbelievable. We can, we cannot do that with today's technology, and uh, and these guys seem to uh, have some extreme knowledge there of not only the the stars, but, you know, of of all these other uh, energies that are earth energies, you might say, and knew how to utilize these for for who knows what, either initiations or healing or or generating energy. Uh, I think they they had the knowledge, and and, uh, I've always thought that's where we need to go is, okay, figure out what were these things, what could they do, and... uh, you know, and what was the technology there? I think uh, we should cooperate more closer to the to the nature because nature can teach us a lot. Uh, there, there, I learned a lot from Professor Gutierrez. He is a famous uh, architect and uh, industrial designer in Bogota, and he has uh, many of those black uh, lutite uh, strange artifacts. And mm-hmm. he said. Uh, many of his ideas he takes out from the nature because nature is most perfect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I do think that we've 
kind of gone in the wrong direction where we have moved so far into technology and we actually should be more than moving more into a natural uh closer to nature and, and getting away from all the um especially on our diet you know with all these pro i know that's off the subject but you know we're we're getting so far away from nature that we're actually becoming synthetic you <laughs> know we're eating all these artificial foods and everything else and and uh yes. i think that's really decreasing our longevity and creating all kinds of serious illnesses and diseases and we forget something how fragile is the new technology because uh, there are so many stories now about uh, 2013 uh, most probably very strong uh, sun storms uh, might reach the earth mm-hmm. that for weeks and months the whole technology wouldn't work oh yeah it's it's uh, that's one of the things i've foreseen and it's it's definitely on the books but uh you know that there are going to be some pretty massive coronal mass ejections and and uh, you know some solar flares hitting the planet and and we all know what happened in the past it melted the telegraph wires and and even some of the uh, uh, buried cables melted as well which was quite interesting so if we don't get on that right away and start putting capacitors in and and gear up for it and have some kind of a system that shuts the the other system down. Or, or regulates it, we are definitely going to be without power and without the Internet and without uh, our bank cards and without being able to pump gas or sewage or anything else. Then it would uh, it would be the best to have a knowledge about nature and how to, <laughs> yeah. to get some food. Yeah, how to grow some food and build an outhouse and a few other things, you know, would be a good idea. That's right, yes. And uh, another thing is uh, why there are so many all worldwide underground labyrinth tunnel systems. For what reasons did they make it? For example, in the south of Austria, an engineer found a huge granite uh, tunnel system until now. He didn't uh, research all the tunnels. He found around six kilometers of underground tunnel system, perfectly done. And the question is, How could they make such a perfect tunnel system, number one? Number two, what the engineer told me is, if you put out stone material, uh, the the mass of the material outside must have around three times the volume of the empty room inside. But in the whole area, you have no uh, stone, little stone mountains with the material they brought out. So this is the question, how did they do these uh, perfect tunnel systems, or Professor uh, Muldashev, a Russian researcher, found in Krita a tremendous huge underground labyrinth, also with a huge tunnel system, or the Cuevas de los Dios in Ecuador, and many, many other places all over the world. For what reason did they build underground tunnel systems in the past? It's a big question. Yeah, and I heard they were doing some uh, digging over there in Egypt, too. I guess they're building the canal or something, and they came across the same thing, a, a real extensive underground uh, tunnel system with rooms, like all, just That's right. That's, rooms. That, uh, there is the French researcher Antoine Chigal. She visited me last weekend, and we talked about that, and she showed me photos. It's incredible, huge mm-hmm. underground uh, systems. Yeah, it, it, it's pretty obvious that they knew something. They knew something came psychically every so often, and they had their their facilities to to go underground and wait it out, and then come.